Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday night service. Who's ready to get into the word tonight? I'm really excited because I get to kick off uh, our sermon series on Wednesday nights. We had just started in the book of Romans in our growth book. And I'm telling you, this is not an easy thing. The book of Romans is actually probably one of the greatest letters that have ever been written in the history of time. And that this letter belongs in the greatest book that has ever been written in the history of time. So who's excited to dive into the book of Romans? There's really not much I can do in one sermon. I've even heard of a church and a pastor that took them 20 years to get through the entire book of Romans. So there's a lot there. So we're barely gonna scratch the surface tonight, but I'm excited. Why don't you bow your head with me? We're gonna pray as we just ask the Holy Spirit to speak through me. This is really for me. Lord, I just pray that you would speak right through me. God, you would just go ahead and take over this night. Open our ears and our hearts to hear from you, God. We cannot wait to dissect and to learn what your word has for us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, and we all say amen. amen. All right, so before I get started, I'm going to do a quick poll. I want to see, um, we've all heard this saying, like, uh, I got good news and I got bad news, right? I got good news and I got bad news. By a show of hands, how many are saying, uh, give me the bad news first? Just give me the bad news first. Okay, that's probably the majority of people. I think that probably the majority of people will say that. Give me the bad news first. I want to end on a good note. Well, there's a story uh, actually of a, a, a case where uh, a doctor got a hold of their patient, and the patient did it the other way around. So the doctor calls this patient and says, I got good news and I got bad news. So the patient says, uh, well, give me the good news first. The doctor says, you have 24 hours to live. The patient says, how is that good news? Okay, well, then give me the bad news. What's the bad news? The doctor said, I've been trying to get a hold of you since yesterday. I can't, I can't, I've been calling you like crazy. All right, all right. All right, all right. Back, let's get serious. Romans 1.16, open your Bible, open your Bible up. This is what the word says. We're going to read from verse 16 to 23, and we're going to see how much we cover tonight. Verse 16 says, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. Someone say, good news. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. But God showed his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. And through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. I know we read this and we think of them as, that's pretty foolish. But how many honest people we have in here that can honestly say, I've been that fool. I've worshiped idols and other things other than God. Even though the evidence has always been there that God exists. I can see it when I just look up and see the stars. I know God exists. I can see it and I know it when you even just, you don't even have to dig deep and see how amazingly crafted our bodies are and how our DNA functions and how things operate in this world. You don't have to dig far to see that God is behind all of this. But it's not that we don't know that God exists. It's just sometimes a refusal to believe 
and to surrender our lives to the all-living God. How many know we've been those fools before? And the way we do that a lot of times is we choose and decide to live a certain lifestyle above God. And we push God to the side and we say, God, there's no room for you. There's no time for you. I'd much rather live for me. I'd much rather live for my sin and my pleasures. That's what I want most. We've all been there. How many know that that's true? We've been there. So in, right now in the book of Romans, Paul is writing this letter to the church in Romans, in Rome. And, and this is considered one of the greatest letters that were ever written, obviously from the most popular book of all time, the Bible. And today what we're going to learn is that uh, from this book, we're going to learn the greatest news that has ever been told and how we can participate in sharing that news to those that we encounter throughout our lives. This book of Romans, it's, it's, such, a, it's such a powerful book. It has so many, yeah, get excited. We got someone excited, hallelujah. <laughs> it, it, the, book, the book of Romans provides the foundations of our faith. And, and what is that? That God is good, he's righteous, he's merciful, and it's because of his grace that we can be forgiven of our sin. But we're just going to take a look at as much as we can. But the question I want to answer tonight is, what is the good news? What is the good news? See, the good news, also known as the gospel, have you ever heard that word gospel? Maybe you've heard the term gospel music. Well, it actually comes from the word gospel or good news, which means this. It's the message proclaiming how God saved sinful people, like you and me, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this is the good news. It's good news. It's not bad news. The good news is that it's, it's the message proclaiming how God saved sinful, wretched, helpless people like you and me through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is some good news. Now, the reason why good news is good is because there is some bad news. And the bad news is that we've all sinned. The bad news is that we've all made mistakes. The bad news is that we've been like those utter fools that have, that have uh, made the decision to choose our own lifestyle above God. We've idolized our lives, idolized our bank accounts, we've idolized our Instagram following, we've idolized so many things about ourselves above God. That's the bad news is because of that, we inherit something called death, which is a price for sin. Sin is not free, unfortunately. Sin may feel good for a season. Sin may give you temporary pleasure. Sin may numb sometimes some of the pain you feel inside or some of the, the dark, darkness that's going on in your heart. Sin will sometimes, feels like it's helping, but in all reality, sin comes with a heavy, heavy price. It's called death. And what death is, death is eternal separation from God forever. We experience death here on this earth, and then we experience it after we die. And there's a place for those that reject God, not that God created this place for any of us, but it's a place we go when we say, God, I want nothing to do with you. Well, where is a place where there's nothing to do with God? It's called hell. And I know I'm coming in strong early, but this is why we need to, this is why, what, see, there's a reason why it's called good news. It's because there's bad news first. Let me give you an illustration. Picture a, a, your boss. It's not good news if your boss, maybe after a long week of work, he pulls you into his or her office and he says this, or she says this, you know what, you worked really hard this week. You did really good, the numbers are up, did a great job. You know what, because of that, I got good news for you. I'm going to give you your paycheck. Now that's not really good news. I'm going to give you your paycheck. You're thinking, man, I want a promotion or a raise or something. No, I'm just going to give you what you earned. Well, that's not really good news, is it? That just sounds like normal news. <laughs> I'll tell you what good news is, though. Good news is like this. 
It is good news that let's say you committed high, high crimes. Let's say you're, fa you're facing years in prison, even the death penalty for your crimes you committed. And then the judge goes ahead and pulls you aside and says this, I love you so much that I've actually provided a way for your record to be wiped totally clean and be set free. Now that's good news. See, it's good news because we owe a high price for the sin we've committed. It's good news because there's a penalty in our heads for the decisions we've made. It's good news because we are headed to destruction, but because God loves us so much, he provided a way for us to be saved, set free, and have eternal life. How many are thankful for the good news? Now that's good news. The good news declares that you can be saved from that penalty. The good news is, is declaring that your record is clean and that you're just as righteous as Jesus Christ himself. That is good news. There's a story, another story I want to share with you of a man who was not ashamed of the good news. And we see, in, if we could pull up Romans 1.16 again, the scripture says this. I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. I'm not ashamed of it. What does ashamed mean? It, it literally means to be embarrassed by your association with it. Or disgraced or humiliated. So what Paul is saying here, he's writing, he's literally saying, I'm not ashamed to be associated with this. I'm not ashamed that this is good news for me. I'm not ashamed that I was wretched and sinful and I was headed to destruction and I was bound and I was lost and I was blind and I was an utter fool. I'm not ashamed to say that. I'm not ashamed that this is good news for me. See, those that are not ashamed of good news are those that know they need a savior. Those that are not ashamed are those that know without God, I'm bound, I'm addicted, I'm lost, I'm a horrible person inside and out. There is no good in me. And I'm not ashamed to say I needed a Savior. And he came and loved me and saved me when no one else would. He did. How many are thankful and not ashamed of that good news? This is good news. It says I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. See, it doesn't say that the good news has power in it. The good news or this message about who Jesus is, this message about what he's done, it doesn't have power in it, but it literally says that the good news is, someone say is, it is the power of God, saving everyone who believes. See, why is the gospel so powerful? Why, why is it the power? Because it can turn sinful people like you and me into a righteous child of God. The gospel is powerful because it can take people who were headed to destruction and now change their eternal address to live with God forever in heaven. The gospel is powerful because it can take a former drug addict that was, that was lost their mind here talking to themselves on the streets of San Bernardino and now, in living, now here in church raising their hands, worshiping Jesus and giving God all the glory. That's why the gospel is so powerful. I know I'm talking to somebody here tonight. That's why this gospel has so much power. This is a quote from, from who? Dwight L. Moody, the quote says this, the gospel is like a lion. All the preacher has to do is open the door of the cage and get out of the way. This message about what Jesus has done, what he has come to do, this is good news for all of us. There is no better news you will ever get in your life than this news here. I'm sure you've gotten great news before. Great news, you got the job, that's great news. Great news, I lost three pounds. Wow, that's great news. Someone's like, hallelujah, I received that one right there. There's a lot of great news, but 
Ne never in your lifetime will you hear news better than when Jesus came down to this earth willingly and offered his life as a sacrifice to pay for the sin that you committed and to give you his righteousness and to declare you perfect and clean and wipe your record so that it looks like you've never ever sinned in your life. Now tell me that is a good news. I'm not ashamed of the good news. Now, Paul, Paul could say that because Paul, at this time, he was a very religious Pharisee, very high-ranking person. Bloodline was pure. I mean, he had a lot of things to be proud of. He was a Christian killer. He, liked, he, he, was, he was one of those guys that people aspire to be like in this time. And then Jesus found him. And then he, be, he began to renounce all of these things and became a slave of Christ. Just think about the, 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 the difference of someone that's a, a high zealot, a high Pharisee, and now calling themselves a slave of Christ. You would think that would be something to be ashamed about, but Paul was not ashamed of it. He was not ashamed to say, Jesus found me and saved me. See, sometimes... It may, it may seem easier, you maybe uh, uh, for some people, that maybe it may seem more obvious to you that you need a Savior. But for some people here in this room, maybe you think it's shameful to admit that you need a Savior. Because maybe you're a high-class business leader. Maybe, maybe you've done a lot for your community. Maybe you're somebody that's always aspired to be moral and to be good in everything you do. But to openly admit that you need a Savior, it may feel shameful for you. But there's nothing to be ashamed about. Because if we're really honest with ourselves, we know that deep down inside, we've made mistakes. There's emptiness. There's pain. There's a lack of purpose. There's no hope without a Savior. And it's not a shameful thing to admit that you need a Savior in this world. Come on. It doesn't matter what walk of life you are. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter if you have a great track record or if you're somebody that came from the streets. All of us in this world need this good news. So I'm not ashamed. Someone say, I'm not ashamed. In other words, I'm saying I'm not embarrassed to be associated with Jesus. I'm not embarrassed to need somebody to save me. I'm not embarrassed to admit that I was drowning in the water and Jesus found me in the middle of the ocean and rescued me and snatched me out of the grips of hell. See, the thing is, we say we're not ashamed. We get excited in church. But studies show that only half of active Christians, what is an active Christian? It's somebody that comes to church at least once a month. That's what you call active? Okay, I guess. I don't know. Try that at your job, Pastor Marco said. Don't sound very active to me. You won't have a J-O-B. <laughs> only half, let's say, only half of active Christians believe that it's their responsibility to share their faith. That means this, that if we divided this room in two, half of you think that, yeah, it's part of my responsibility and duty to share the good news. I don't know why I'm pointing to this side. I'm sorry to my left, but I just pointed to my right. I know, wow, sorry. The other half, the other half believes this. They believe it's a good thing, but they don't think it's their responsibility. They think it's the pastor's job. They believe it's the apostle's job. They believe it's all those people that work at the church. That's, the, it's, that's their job, literally. That's what they get paid to do. So there's only half of active Christians that actually believe it's their duty to share good news with people. See, most, here's a, another crazy stat. Most unchurched Americans, which means Americans, they don't go to church. They're not active. They don't go to church. They say they have multiple, um, some of them that say they have multiple Christian friends. But they say that those friends have never shared Christ with them. This is the majority of those that don't go to church that say they have Christian friends. They say the majority of those say their Christian friends have never shared Christ with them. Never shared the good news with them. Here's another crazy stat. 90% of Christians have never led someone to Jesus. 
So, we have a lot of work to do. I know we say things like, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, but the rubber meets the road when you're in your work and you're in the break room and it's lunchtime and someone tells you, man, I've been struggling lately, or they say, man, I'm hurting inside, and you have an opportunity to speak up and say, I know that's bad news, I know that it doesn't look pretty, but I got some good news for you. This is where the rubber meets the road. I want to answer this question, why don't Christians share the good news? Take a look at this graph behind me. What prevents you from sharing your faith, this is a study done on thousands of Christians. And here are some of the crazy stats. 30% of it makes up fear and rejection. 30% of the reason why Christians say they don't share their faith is, is fear and rejection. Fear of what? Well, fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of uncertainty, how it's going to play out. See, here's the thing. The Bible tells me, in Deuteronomy 31, 6, it says, be strong and brave. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be terrified because of them. The Lord, your God, will go with you. He will never leave you. He'll never desert you. See, this scripture is for somebody that maybe feel, may feels a little fear. They know they have the good news inside of them. You know you got it in you, but maybe you're a little bit of a little bit of afraid to tell somebody. Well, this scripture is for you. Don't be afraid. Be brave. Don't be afraid of their faces because the Lord is with you every time you preach the good news to somebody. See, what sometimes takes this fear out of me, this, this thought of fear of rejection uh, off of my mind is this. I'm, I'm reminded that your job is not to change the heart. Your job is to tell them about someone who can. See, God wants us to just be obedient in telling them about him. He's not calling us to change someone's behavior. See, you're, you're not supposed to go in there and try and change someone's lifestyle and behavior. That's all God's job. He does the transforming. He does the change. He does the miracle. The power's in the gospel. All you got to do is tell them. See, this is what sometimes eliminates this fear of rejection, from me at least, when I realize it's not my responsibility to change them. I just got to tell them about the one who can. Just tell them. I remember when I was in high school, I had a friend who was an outspoken atheist. And, you know, we were in a lot of the same classes for many years. I'm talking from freshman year all the way to my senior year. We were in a lot of the same classes. And he was an outspoken atheist. He didn't believe in God. He thought it was all fairy tales. He thought I was weird. I used to walk around with the Bible in my hand. He thought I was weird for that. But he was my friend. We connected in a lot of other ways. And I considered him my friend. He considered me his, my, uh, uh, me his friend. And I remember I finally got the courage to talk to him about Jesus. And I would talk to him about Jesus, and I would talk to him about Jesus, and he would reject it. I know you're looking for the happy story where he received the Lord right there in my class. He'd reject it. And then um, I remember one day I was telling him about Jesus, another class. Uh, uh, we, had, we had geometry, and then the next year we had Spanish together. And in Spanish class, there I am again, telling him about Jesus, talking to him about the good news. And there he is again, rejecting it. And there was another Christian friend that I had in the class, and we would tag team. We, would just, we, we just jumped him, Chris, Christian style. We are just jumping him in the back of the classroom with the Bible. I mean, we literally would print out pages of prophecies that were fulfilled from the Old Testament that, that give validity to who Jesus says he is. I mean, we were going deep. We brought out all the tools. We were like, he is no way out. He's cornered. We got him trapped. He would just reject it. I had him again in a junior year in, in my English classes, and we reject it. Senior year comes. It's one day after class, I find him in the hallway. I just try one more time. I just remember talking to him, and, I, and I'm telling you, I, I loved him like a brother. 
And this is where it was all flowing from. It wasn't me trying to get a, a win. Or it wasn't me trying to just get, you know, a notch on my belt. He mattered to me. And I loved him. I remember I talked to him after class one day. I said, you know, bro, I know you're going through something. You're going through a lot. The truth is, Jesus loves you. He created you. He has a plan for your life. And I would have expected a rejection again and again and again because it's happened over and over and over. But something shifted in his heart. I was just planting seed and watering it. But God in that moment was doing the saving. He gave his life to the Lord right there after class. Senior year of high school, he got saved. Why? Because I just told him some good news. I didn't go in and try and change him. I didn't go in and tell him what he can and can't do. I didn't go in and try to be a religious zealot to him. All I did was tell him how much God loves him, and I shared the good news with him. And now my friend is saved, and I'm going to see him in heaven one day. Because I shared the good news. So don't be afraid if they say no. It's the worst that can happen. A second reason, according to that graph, a second reason why Christians don't share the good news is lack of opportunity or being busy. Lack of opportunity or being busy, it makes up 25% of the reason why Christians don't share the good news. Now, it sounds like a good reason. Oh, I've just been working so much, you know what I mean? I got a lot to take care of. I got bills to pay. I got bills to pay. Yep, bills to pay. See, but the reality is there's opportunities all around us. Question is, do you see them? It says in Acts 3.12, says Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. If you fast forward to chapter 4, verse 4, Acts 4.4, 4, it says, Many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. Why? Because Peter saw an opportunity and he took advantage of it. See, when you're looking for the opportunities, you'll begin to notice them all around you. Not only do you notice opportunities, but you, you, be, you begin to create opportunities out of situations. You can create opportunity anytime you want. On your way home tonight. I know you're probably going to swing by Jack in the Box right on the corner or talk about it's right up Hallmark. You're going to be in that drive through window. That person's going to take your order. No one's behind you. Say, hey, can I tell you something really quick? There's an opportunity right there. Who knows, that person at Taco Bell does not know what's coming. There's probably 10 of you guys going over there telling them about Jesus. <laughs> They're going to be like, what is going on? Lord, is that you? I remember one time I created, I created my own opportunity. This was, now this, I hope this is encouraging for somebody that feels disqualified from telling the good news. Because I was not in a good place in my life. I was struggling with sin. I felt so dirty and bound by sin. And I, I just felt so lost. I felt so broken. And I remember it was one summer. This time I had, I, I just got my truck so I, was, I could drive anywhere. I was feeling cool. But I remember one summer I felt so down. And I got so upset at the devil. I said, you know what? That's it. It was a random Tuesday afternoon. I said, devil, I'm going to give you a black eye. Here's what I'm going to do. I got my Bible, jumped in my truck, and drove to the mall. And I said, I'm going to find somebody to witness to, and I'm going to preach the gospel to them. So what do I do? I'm walking around. I go to the mall with my Bible, and I feel awkward as ever. I mean, let me tell you, this is weird. People are just shopping. It's literally nothing but stay-at-home moms with their strollers. That's on a Tuesday afternoon. Who else is at the mall? Walking around, I'm looking for somebody. I'm like, Lord, just lead me. And I see a guy sitting by himself. He's got like a biker jacket on, street bike. He's got his helmet with him. I just, here's an opportunity. There's a chair next to him. I introduce myself. I'm like, hey, man, how's it going? What's your name? Weird, right? Random. <laughs> at the mall. I introduce myself. He, he's talkative. He introduces himself. He tells me, I'm not from around here. He says, as a matter of fact, I don't even know why I came to this mall. I live super far. I just got up and felt like coming here. I've never been here before. So I said, 
Okay, God, I see you. I see you. I preach the gospel to him right there. I tell him some good news about what God has done in my life, and that man gets saved. I've never seen him to this day, but God did the saving. All I had to do was share some good news. Colossians 4.3 says, pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. See, opportunities will come when you pray about them, when you're thinking about them, when you open doors that maybe no one else can open. Praying for them shows you want these opportunities to come up. Not because you're so brave, not because you're some big shot Christian, no, but because you want people to know so badly about the Jesus that saved you and you want them to be saved and set free. <laughs> Last point I'll share, the third reason why we don't share the good news, this is literally on that graph. Can we show the graph again? This makes up 26% of the reason. These were the reasons that were given. Nothing and lack of interest. So what prevents you from sharing your faith? Nothing and lack of interest. Literally, what prevents you? Nothing, lack of interest, makes up 26% of the reason why Christians don't share their faith. So you may be thinking, I'm not fearful. You may also be thinking, I don't ignore opportunities. I just don't do it. I'm not interested. This is what some Christians feel when it comes to sharing their faith. Nothing. I feel nothing towards that. I feel nothing towards their eternal uh, salvation. I feel nothing towards where they're going to go after they die. I feel nothing and I couldn't care less. I don't feel it. I don't feel it. There's a quote that says, the opposite of love is not hate but indifference. In other words, what this is saying is, I couldn't care less what happens to them. See, this isn't love. Love isn't not caring. Love is caring enough to speak up and to talk to somebody. Love is caring when you see somebody at your job that maybe is not as happy as they normally are. You know something's going on at home. You have a chance to share good news with somebody, but you couldn't care less. That's not love. Love is sharing it with them. Love is caring for them. Love is putting yourself on the line. Love is not caring if you get rejected. Not caring if people spit on your face. Love is not caring if the opportunity is there or not. Love is saying, I love you. I care for you enough. I'm going to share some good news with you. John 15, 13 says, no one has greater love than the one who gives their life for their friends. We must pray that God would fill you with his love enough so that we can lay down our own fears. We can lay down our own busy schedules and our hard hearts so that your friends, your family can know Jesus. Someone say, I am not ashamed of the good news. The worship team can come up now. I'll share one last story with you of a man who wasn't ashamed. See, I want everyone to know this. Time is ticking on our lives. That means that there is an appointed time where we, we will all die. And that time is closer and closer and closer every day that you live. Just think about that. You're getting closer and closer and closer to that day every single day. It's the appointed time we will all die. You may not know the time, but thank God that you're alive right now to hear this good news. There's a story in 1996. News media covered a story of a hijacked jet. There was 163 passengers, 12 crew members that were on that plane. But well, the pilot was able to get a hold of the plane again, but they ran out of fuel out in the middle of the ocean. This is an actual picture of that plane before it went down. The pilot was able to maneuver 
attempted an emergency landing. Because of the way the plane was going down, it was not promising for a lot of people. So one of the passengers, his name is Andrew Meekins. He's actually an elder of a church in Ethiopia. He was on his way to a Bible conference. People described him as a very reserved man. In other words, an introvert. So for all my introverts out there, yes, this message is for you too. But he was deeply committed to his faith. He was deeply committed to God. According to, so this is crazy, there were some people that survived. And according to those survivors of the crash, after the pilot announced the emergency landing, Meekins unbuckled his seatbelt, stood up in front of the whole plane and the whole cabin and began to preach the gospel and tell them the good news. He invited people to respond. And one person that survived, one of the flight attendants actually survived. And they said that about 20 people accepted Christ in that moment, including one of her fellow flight attendants who died on the crash. Andrew Meekins did not survive that plane crash, but he went on to live in heaven along with all those others that he told the good news to. So, I don't mean to make this a very scary or eerie moment, but let's just pretend we're on that flight right now. There's moments we have to live. We do not know if we're gonna survive. We do not know where we will be tomorrow. I have good news for you. Jesus loves you enough that he was willing to lay down his own life to pay for the sin that you've committed so that he can give you his righteousness, his forgiveness and eternal life. And you don't earn this based on the way you live. You cannot earn God's love. He just loves you, but you can't earn righteousness. The Bible says our good works, they're like filthy rags to the Lord. And so in other words, when we try to be good, it's, not, it's never gonna be good enough. We've sinned. We are doomed to hell unless someone saves us. And that was, that's what Jesus came to do. So now who can be saved? Who can be saved? Anyone who believes in Jesus Christ and puts their faith in him as their Lord and Savior. So in this moment tonight, if you know, if you can acknowledge that you've been one of those that you are, maybe now, you're in that place of sin. You can acknowledge that you've made a lot of mistakes. You can acknowledge that if you were to die today, you, have, you do not know where you would go. As a matter of fact, maybe you can even acknowledge that I'd probably go to hell based on my lifestyle right now. And if you're saying today, and you're not ashamed to admit that you need a savior and you're not ashamed to repent, which means to turn away from that lifestyle and give your life to Jesus, then today, tonight, you can be saved. Tonight can be the night where you give your life to Jesus, where you're forgiven of all your sin and you, you leave here with eternal life. Tonight could be your night. So I'm gonna count to three. And if that's you, and this message has been good news for you, and you know right now there's bad news, but you needed this good news, and you want to give your life to Jesus, and when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand all over this room, and you're saying, that's me, I want to give my life to Jesus, I want to be forgiven of my sin, and I want to inherit eternal life. One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this room. I see your hands. I see those hands. One, two, three, four, five, six seven, eight, nine, anybody else? 10, 11, I see you, 12, 13, anybody else? 14, anybody else? You're saying that's me. 15, I see you. 16, I see you. 17, I see you. 18, come on, 19, I see you too. Anybody else? Pop your hand up. You're saying that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. 20, 21, come on, give God some praise right now for those souls. 22, I see you in the back. Why don't we do this? Before everyone leaves, let's stand to our feet right now. I'm gonna invite, we got a prayer team that's actually gonna come. They're gonna stand up here at the front. And for all 22 people that raise your hand tonight to accept Jesus, I got good news for you. 
He loves you. He's been waiting for this moment, and he's calling you to himself right now. And for those 22 that raise your hand, can you do me one more favor? Can you make your way out of your seat? And can you come to the front so that we can pray with you? Come on, church. Now's the time where we get excited. We clap. We're witnessing a miracle right now. We're witnessing the power of God in people's lives tonight. Come on, church. Let's clap for every person that makes their way forward. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, they're still coming, and we're still clapping. We're still celebrating. This is good news. This is good news. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Everyone that came forward, I just want to say we love you so much. We're very proud of you. Everyone that came forward, if you could... Just look at me for another moment. We're, we're committing. No, well, I'll, I'll put it this way. God loves you. He's saving you. And, and he's saving you from sin. He's saving you from your pain. He's saving you from bondage. What we're going to do, we're going to help you every step of the way. So we have discipleship classes here at our church. What is a discipleship class? It's how you learn how to be more like God, how, learning how to walk with him. And then here's what's important. You're going to get baptized. Baptism is, if you've seen it, people get dunked in the water. What does that represent? Represents you dying to your old self, like you're going under a grave and coming up a brand new person. Tell me that's not good news. Isn't that good news? So the person in front of you, they're going to pray with you, and they're going to get you signed up for the class. It's called Holy Warriors, and we're actually launching this Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Isn't that right? This Sunday at 9 a.m. Just want to confirm. Thumb up. Okay, cool. Thank you, all my altar people. <laughs> Let's do this. Bow your heads with me. Repeat this prayer after me. Say this to the Lord out loud, but mean this from your heart. Say, God, thank you for loving me enough to send your son Jesus to die on the cross and resurrect from the dead to save me. You did this because you love me. Forgive me of my sin. I acknowledge that I am lost without you. But I'm thankful that you found me and saved me. Give me a new heart and a new life. Fill me with your spirit so that th from this moment forward, I'll never be the same again. My life is yours, and I will live for you. In Jesus' name I pray, and we all say amen. Church. If that is good news, give God some praise right now. Let's end this night with one shout of praise. He's a good God. We love you so much. God bless you. This Friday is Unity Night. This Friday is Unity Night. Pastor Lisa's preaching to all the women this Friday at 7 p.m. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be powerful. Sunday, Pastor Marco is going to do part two of his growth message. It's going to be powerful. Love you. If you need prayer, come forward. We'd love to pray with you. Remember, God is for you. There's no one who can come against you.